warm welcome to this interview on the impact of the latest ESC guidelines on patient management in patients with heart failure and secondary mitral regurgitation. It's my great pleasure and honor to co-share this interview with Marco Metra, the lead author in the 2021 Heart Failure Guidelines from the University of Brescia. My name is Ross Stefan von Bartleben from the University of Mainz in Germany. From the latest guidelines in 2016 and 2017, we have seen that major clinical trials were recently introduced that had an impact on the treatment of secondary mitral regurgitation in heart failure and treatment aspects in this period. Those were the MITRA FR trial, which seemed to be neutral in the beginning on mortality and on clinical benefits, but had slight changes in the second and third year. And we have the very positive co opt data looking at the same treatment population with slightly less dilated ventricles and with more MR that had a positive effect on outcome, mortality, recurrent heart failure hospitalization, and influenced both the US December 2020 as well as the 21 guidelines in Europe. So the session objectives here will be what is new in these guidelines, what are the similarities and the key interconnections. And it's my great pleasure to hand over now to Marco Metra to talk about the topic, what is new in the ESC 21, 2021 guidelines. Marco, please. Thank you, Stefan. And I had, uh, as you said, the honor to co-chair the ESC guidelines on heart failure. We had a, a personalized perspective to the treatment of heart failure and uh, secondary mitral regurgitation has been recognized as a key comorbidity in the patients with heart failure. And it has two major roles. It may favor the progression of cardiac dysfunction through left ventricular overload and may also have a major impact on symptoms and tolerance of drug treatment through the increase in pulmonary uh, pressures and the decrease in cardiac, in, uh, cardiac forward cardiac output. But now, so we have acknowledged that it's important to treat the secondary mitral regurgitation. And the key role is the one by the R team. So Stefan, if you want to let us know about it. Yeah, I think it's very important that uh, class one indication has evolved from a view to a new heart team approach that was introduced more than 10 years ago and was already available in the 2012 uh, uh, guidelines. Um, and what we see is that the decision keystone and the expansion to involve all clinical specialties is actually integrated in this heart team. So for the first time, the ESC heart failure guidelines really acknowledge to include interventional cardiologists and uh, valvular specialists from both interventional cardiology and heart surgery into the treatment process, as we already did with the EP specialists, heart failure specialists, geriatricians, and many more specialists, depending on the individual patient situation. And all these specialists will talk to the patient and will talk between each other to highlight the best strategy for the individual patient and the individual patient strategy. Marco, what about heart failure and the valvular disease guidelines? Well, first of all, uh, these two guidelines were synchronized, not only with respect to when they were published, but also with respect to the indications. And I must say that it was one of the topics, uh, treatment of secondary mitral regurgitation, it was one of the topics where the agreement was uh, more uh, evident and uh, uh, reached without any difficulties. This, despite we were basing, we are based on two trials with the discrepant results, mitral FR and COAPT, but we uh, all acknowledged and agreed that the uh, enrollment criteria played a major role uh, causing the differences in the results. And therefore, uh, we now have a class 2A recommendation 
for percutaneous uh, treatment of secondary mitral regurgitation, that is to say it should be performed in the patients who have the criteria as those enrolled in quad. So no uh, severe right ventricular dysfunction, no severe pulmonary hypertension, and uh, uh, no uh, clinical instability. And these patients are likely to have a benefit on outcome. On the other hand, we have a 2B recommendation, that is to say percutaneous treatment may be considered uh, to improve symptoms and or as a bridge to transplantation or LVAD in the patients who do not fulfill the COAPT criteria. And now, Stefan, let us know what the valvular heart disease guidelines said. Absolutely. And I, I think what is new in the valvular heart disease guidelines is that we not only should um, uh, treat those patients in time, but also that we have for the first time the recognition that even revascularization and the treatment of valvular disease to unload the ventricle is given as a potential for interventional treatment. I think it's important to understand if we look into the COAP criteria and the COAP trial, that these patients were already at a very late stage in their treatment process. And we've seen in sub-analysis that patients do very well if the ventricle is not too dilated, if the relation between ejection fraction and the uh, relevance of the mitral regurgitation, this means a grade three plus or four plus regurgitation has to be present in order to convey benefits to the patient, as you nicely pointed out, Marco, in the 2A recommendation. For the other patients, there is also a clinical benefit highlighted in the 2B recommendation that we may, if there is no other treatment available, also improve the symptoms of the patient and the quality of life, which may be very important for patients suffering from dyspnea. Very important in the community to realize is that we should not wait till the very end to a terminally sick patient with a high one-year mortality. And we see that the mortality in the co-op trial was between 19 and 23% at one year, and that we had significant reductions both in mortality with a number needed to treat of seven or eight at two and three years, as well as only a number needed to treat of four for recurrent heart failure hospitalization. So I think the idea, as we discussed, of the multidisciplinary team, including the heart failure specialist, is recommended that we have to move from a very long sequential approach where we wait for each uptitration of a medication alone to a more parallel approach of both the medication, but not to wait too long for the referral and the strategy development together with the EP person in devices and with the valvular specialist in both interventional therapy and heart surgery to move there in a parallel treatment approach that includes heart valve clinics, heart valve centers in a network structure. So Marco, what would be your key takeaways uh, from the interview today? Well, uh, treatment of the patient with heart failure is complex. It requires an R team approach, and secondary mitral regurgitation may have a key role for the progression of heart failure and for patient symptoms. Medical treatment must be optimized, CRT used when possible and when indicated. And then, if the patient has severe mitral or uh, mitral regurgitation, uh, percutaneous treatment of this valve disease should or may be considered depending on the characteristic of the patients. Now it's time to raise awareness regarding this uh, possibility and to have the involvement of all the specialists and all the physicians involved with the treatment of the patients with heart failure. Uh, then what's next? Uh, we don't only have the mitral valve disease. We have other valve disease. I don't know. I wonder whether Stefan can say the last words. Thank you, Marco, very much. And I think, yes, we're facing, I think, 
new data from randomized controlled trials. This may be the Reshape 2 trial, which will put up a third cohort. We will see more long-term data at three to four years from the two big trials, MITREF-R and COAPT. And as you pointed out, we are also moving in heart failure to the tricuspid valve, where currently four randomized controlled trials are enrolling more than 2,000 patients against optimized medical therapy. So I think the awareness of the community, the improvement of the patient management will gain much more clinical data in the very near future of the next two to three years. Marco, it was a pleasure having this interview with you. And I say hello to all the participants of PCR London Bells. Thank you very much for your kind hello. attention. Bye-bye.